So corrugator supercilii is a muscle that runs from the periosteum medially all the way up through all the different layers through the fat pads and then touches the dermis on the far lateral point. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And today we're talking about muscles of the face. So I really want to share some of my understanding so that you can become a better injector, make better decisions, explain things better to your patients. And we're starting today with the upper face. So what do injectors need to know about the muscles of the upper face? So before we dive in, give us a like. Uh, if you have faith, you're going to learn something from us today. It means a lot. Thank you. Well, the first thing about the upper face involving the frontalis muscle is the frontalis muscle is probably the hardest area to treat when you first start injecting. Now, like anything, if you're super experienced, it might be easy. But in the beginning, the first 18 months or so of injecting, um, it's the area that confuses the most number of people. And there's a number of reasons for, for this. Um, one is that it's highly variable not just in terms of the anatomy between individuals, there are, re there are really big differences. So some people have small foreheads. That is so cool. Some people have long foreheads. You get muscles that look like two separate plates and muscles that look like just one plate. Um, you get in men, for example, the frontalis muscle often goes right up higher into the beyond the hairline or where the hairline should be, but it recedes. But you, you can see it's a different shape in men. Um, you also are going for different results. So if you think about the difference between a man and a woman in terms of the aesthetic result you might go for, um, with usually are trying to lift eyebrows in women. You're trying to create a nice feminine arch. But if you create a feminine arch in a man, it looks a bit sinister, unfortunately, or just a bit weird. You know, there's something odd about it. Um, Gary Glitter, you know, Joseph Fritzl, those guys don't look so warm and cuddly and uh, they've got very arched eyebrows and there's something about that. So um, we need to, we have different aesthetic goals for different patients, but also wildly different anatomy between patients. And you need to learn a set of principles that allow you to treat any forehead, not a set of a, a simple injection pattern that someone tells you you can apply to any forehead that you come across, because that is simply never going to work. Is it a common area to get side effects? Well, yes. Well, not only is it highly variable, but that's one of the reasons why side effects are a bit more common, which is that we were going for these different outcomes. And for example, if you did a, a more masculine treatment pattern, you might get no lines on the forehead, but you're going to drop a, a female's eyes, then they would call that a side effect. You know, I've got a brow ptosis. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons it's tricky. But the, the other key thing about the frontalis muscle is that we're always trying to only partially treat it. There are very few people that you completely obliterate the whole muscle with. So there's always some movement and that some movement is required to support the eyebrows. And if you overtreat the middle, you get a medial brow ptosis and a lateral brow lift, that's Spock brow. If you overtreat laterally, in theory, you could, get, you could lose the arch of the eyebrow and still have movement in the middle and look a bit sad. Um, if you overtreat the whole lot, you just look very tired uh, as your eyebrows are settled and you actually cause something in the wrong patient if you've got the type of skin that rolls straight from the forehead all the way onto the onto the eyelids, you can you can almost look like a bilateral brow to eyelid ptosis, even though if you look carefully, it's not. So plenty of side effects um, in terms of aesthetic complications, and they all come from using a blanket approach, either too much toxin on everyone or the same injection pattern on everyone that you meet. And that's why these nuances of how to decide how much and where to place product uh, make a big difference. But to do that, you've got to understand the underlying muscle. So what's your best tip for treating the frontalis? The first thing is you've got to assess each, each patient individually and you've got to start by putting the areas where you don't want to inject. That's probably the easiest way not to mess up um, is, to, is to start out by deciding where you aren't going to inject. And that normally makes it much easier to decide where you are going to inject. We actually have a great download on this, which you can get in the link down below. Um, but essentially, it's that safety margin lower down so you don't cause a brow ptosis about two centimeters from the orbital rim. And that should prevent most heaviness. It's more complex than that. So do get the download. Um, and um, that, that's, that's step one. You also want to decide where it's going to be a waste. So if there's an aponeurosis there and you can see there's no muscle, don't waste your toxin injecting there. By the time you've drawn on all the areas where you don't want to inject, there's usually a relatively small area where you do want to inject. And that makes things a lot easier. Um, the second really important thing I suggest you do is think about your treatments as a journey. Don't, don't, you don't have to listen to anyone who says it's all to be done in one session. I mean, you can get to that point when you've been injecting the same patient for two or three cycles. You'll know exactly where to inject that patient and you shouldn't be following them up every single time. 
but on the first time you meet a new patient, if they're particularly if there's something atypical about their forehead, expect to do it in stages. And if you're going to do it in stages, the first step is you make your best guess, but you leave room for adding more, improving your results. Because if you try and get it all right in one, you're a bit more likely to cause an overtreatment. So that's loss of an eyebrow arch or a ptosis. And there's just fewer options at that point. It's better if you leave room for a top up than if you're trying to then correct a side effect because you've tried to do all in one go in your first treatment. So think of your treatment with your first client as a journey, not a single treatment with a destination. So what's the next most important muscle in the upper face? So upper face treatment, uh, once you've treated your horizontal forehead lines, it's probably the elevenses uh, caused by your corrugator muscle. So the corrugator supercilia is the next most important muscle. So what do injectors need to know? It's really important to understand the anatomy of these muscles because they directly inform how you would how you would inject. So corrugator supercilii is a muscle that runs from the periosteum medially all the way up through all the different layers through the fat pads and then touches the dermis on the far lateral point. So once you understand that root of the muscle, that really should directly inform how you inject. And that's one way to minimize your side effects, to maximize your product efficiency, is that you inject deeper medially, getting more superficial as you get to the lateral part of the brow. So fewer side effects, more efficiency, and it's a great way to inject. So when you say side effects, do you mean eyelidosis? Yeah, it's probably injecting the corrugator that's responsible for most of the cases of eyelidosis. And the reason for that is as you get more lateral, um, when you're injecting toxin, you're also closer to the supertrochlear foramen. So there's an artery and a nerve that runs through the septum. And in theory, if you're placing toxin right near there, that might be where the toxin is getting in, relaxing the levator pulpary muscle, which is your eyelid muscle, and causing atosis. So the great thing about knowing the anatomy is that as you get closer to that more high risk point, you actually can inject more superficially still get a better result but you're also you've at least got a fat pad in between you and that foramen and that's going to reduce the chance of nylatosis so knowing the anatomy directly reduces risk in theory anything else interesting about the corrugators um, it's also probably worth knowing about the vectors. So vectors in the face is a, it's a key thing to understand about toxin in general, but corrugators often have, have a very different vector in different people. So some people, if you ask them to frown, they're relatively flat, so the, the muscle just squeezes like that, whereas other people might have quite a strong downward vector, and, and that can just affect um, whether or not you should treat it when you're treating the frontalis, for example. My frown is coming back at the moment. What would you do if you were treating my friend? Well, yes, we're still in lockdown in the UK and we're paying our own price. Um, <laughs> so um, what would I do with it? Your frown is actually very, very symmetrical and you're not too partic- no, not too downward. So you, you're not pulling your eyebrows down heavily um, and a relatively small procerus muscle as well, which we're going to touch on next. Um, there's nothing complex about it. You'd probably just have a standard dose. You could probably do slightly less than standard because your procerus is not very strong maybe 18 units, something like that. Have I got full movement back? 95%. Mm. September the 16th was when I last had my first flux. <laughs> Corrugators, should you always treat when you're treating the frontalis? So the rule of thumb is always treat the two together. But the reality is, you know, like with any rule of thumb, there are, there are occasions when you don't actually need to. And it's all about understanding this vector. And you will meet patients who basically don't have much of a corrugator. They're not big frowners. And if they, if you do force them to frown, they don't have a downward pull on their vector, on, on that muscle. So the reason we normally recommend treating the frontalis muscle with the corrugator or the corrugator with the frontalis is because of this downward vector. If you just treat the frontalis, which normally lifts the muscle up, and you leave the corrugator untreated, they can end up with a much scarier frown. So um, I've had uh, this I learned through experience because if the patient comes back, um, it's often with the complaint of something like, my partner thinks I'm cross when I'm not. And that's because your little downward interested look suddenly looks like the look of thunder because mm. you're, you're pulling really down uh, and uh, and it just looks a bit scarier. So they come back because that's not the intention of the treatment. So um, as soon as you neutralize that, they, bec- they reach a more harmonious position. So as a rule of thumb, yes, always treat them together. But you can, with experience and with good analysis, find patients who actually don't need that done uh, and examine them. And it's a good idea to explain this to your patients. I would normally get the mirror up and show them or show them on me and say, the reason why I'm recommending you do two areas instead of one is because of this vector that you've got. You've got a, a downward pull, and if I don't treat it, you're going to look angrier than you mean to. What other important muscles are there in the upper face? 
Well, there's another muscle which is worth discussing. I wouldn't necessarily say it's that important because you tend to treat it whether you know about it or not, which is the depressor supercilia. So this is a little muscle that's more medial uh, than the corrugator and pulls more down. So the idea is it's about here and it pulls straight down. And a lot of people think it's actually just an, a, a, a component of orbicularis oculi. It's not actually a separate muscle. Um, but it is a, a medial depressor. And so if you're wanting to lift someone's eyebrows, you might purposely be thinking about that. Um, the, the reason why it clinically doesn't matter that much is because I think quite often while you're treating the medial part of corrugator supercilli, you're also treating depressor supercilli. And um, the ex small exception would be if you have someone who's still pulling down um, and you think you've treated that medial component quite well, it could be that you just need a slightly more superficial injection because the corrugator supercilli, the depressor supercilli is more superficial than the corrugator supercilli. So maybe a, a slightly more superficial injection might help. Um, but it's not usually a very powerful muscle and uh, it's, it's just something to understand. What's next in the Hall of Fame of upper face muscles? So uh, there's really one more left in the full upper face, which is the procerus. So this is the that medial muscle that runs at the bridge of your nose and usually just pulls the labella down towards the nose. What do we need to know about procerus? Well, the, the procerus muscle is, the probably the main thing to know about it is it's hugely variable. So um, don't get into the habit of just injecting the same number of units every single time you treat the procerus because unless it's the same patient, the chances are you're wasting it sometimes, maybe under treating on, on other occasions. And um, this is because it's sometimes so small that it's basically absent. I can't see any downward movement. And I effectively say clinically, there's no procerus muscle. And on a small percentage of patients, it's actually the dominant muscle. And this is this is really interesting to see because it's very different. But you just get that crease that runs over the top of the nose and it's a complete downward pull and sometimes very little in terms of corrugator action. So those patients just have a, have a different focus in terms of the dosage that you put in. You might be putting in 12 units in the procerus and very little into the corrugator, but you just need to identify that at the beginning. So there's lots going on with these muscles. How can you tell without peeling someone's skin off which is which? Um, well, the first is just watch them move and ask them to do those movements. So a lot of patients actually can't consciously control all these movements. So a little trick is to either show them a mirror or do the movement to them themselves. Now, this doesn't work if you've had your own treatment, which is an issue for many <laughs> clinicians. Um, but a lot of patients cannot. The other thing that's quite interesting is that some patients can't frown when they're lying down. It's almost like they're in a relaxed state. <laughs> And you, when they're 45 degrees, I can't get them to frown. I need them to, get to sit up and then suddenly then they can do the, do the movement. Um, but otherwise, do the expression to them and ask them to mirror you and you can get them to do most of the expressions that way. Um, and look at each area on its own because there's a lot of movement going on when someone starts moving their face. Just look at that one area. And step two would be to actually feel it. If you're not sure, see if you can feel the vector. So put your your uh, finger on the area that's being treated and see which direction your finger moves and that can help you identify the vectors a bit better um, because you can actually feel the pull in these different directions. Any more Procerus tips and tricks? Um, well one thing I do that, that's quite interesting is if you're doing a non-surgical rhinoplasty and someone has um, a little bump that you're trying to correct uh, sometimes you can see that the pull of the Procerus is causing a bend exactly on the part of the nose that's causing the bump to see so you can correct it with filler but as soon as they move there's a degree of movement that restores the, the bump that you're trying to get rid of. So uh, sometimes I'll do toxin before I do anything else, uh, relax that muscle, and it also gives the toxin a bit, some, a, basically a more still surface to bed in on, and hopefully it enables it to last a bit longer that way as well. So it's, you're looking for those patients with a strong procerus that causes some curvature in the nose or a line in the nose, and sometimes it's worth treating the procerus for that reason, even though they often aren't coming in for anything to do with lines and wrinkles. So how about the crow's feet? Tell us about that. So what you mean is orbicularis oculi is the muscle that causes most of those lines, although some of them are, could be caused by the zygomatic muscle. Um, but we'll talk about that next week. So this is the circular muscle that runs underneath, uh, very close to the surface, around your eye, underneath the skin. And uh, it's, very, it's quite a complex muscle because of the multiple different vectors involved. So because it's circular and runs all the way around the eye, at different points it's pulling in different directions. So... Um, this is the thing that makes it a bit tricky, and especially when you get into treating things that are off-label. So if you're just just treating lateral canthal lines, you can get by without knowing too much about it. 
Um, but with experience, you'll start to notice that it's a bit more complex than just relaxing the muscle. So, uh, for example, in a small percentage of patients, if you relax the lateral canthal lines, you'll start to see a medial pull. And that's because the vector was neutralized. There was a, a relatively neutral vector where you're squeezing just laterally. But as you relax that, you start to squeeze medially. And if you chase those lines, it can get even worse to the point where every time the patient does a little smile, you get the strong pull medially. That doesn't happen in all patients, but it happens in some. And it's one of the Botox signs um, that make people look unnatural is that they have this medial vector because they've tried so hard to treat everything with toxin. Um, and sometimes you need to put less in and find another way of treating it, for example, dermal filler or, or other modalities. Tell me more about those vectors around the eyes. Why is it so complex? So the orbicularis oculi being circular, it has different effects at different parts. So um, if, you th if you think about it, it's actually in a tug of war with the eyebrow and the frontalis. The frontalis muscle is pulling up and orbicularis oculi is pulling down. So this tug of war is going on. If you relax orbicularis oculi, you get a lift in the eyebrow. So it's one of the ways of doing a subtle eyebrow lift. Um, and that can help when you it's in, even become a treatment for a brow ptosis, if you've overtreated the frontalis, you can then relax the muscle that's winning the tug of war, the, the orbicularis oculi, and you'll get a little bit of a lift. Um, but in the cheek as well, it's an accessory muscle for cheek elevation. Certainly, if you overtreat orbicularis oculi, the smile can look less genuine. So it's actually called a Duchenne smile, which is the it's a type of smile that our brains know is a real there's a real emotion behind it, and we can all do the pretend smile. <laughs> which isn't real and then when you do the real one it's slightly different now for most patients there's enough movement that you actually still get a, a Duchenne smile but if you've over treated it uh, it looks a bit flat and um, that's one of the downsides but part of that is because the cheek moves less than it would because it's like the last 20% of a smile is your cheek being elevated by orbicularis oculi and um in older people, it can also even be cause, cause the cheek to look sagged and move medially, and it can actually make them look older. It's one of the reasons why you've got to be careful with toxin in older people, is because they it tends to, it can make the lower face drop a little bit because there's so little support. The muscles are holding everything together. Over treat it to try and get rid of lines, and things can can go south. Not permanently though, or is it? Yeah, as long as the muscle gets back to its normal mm -hmm. strength, it will go back. But it's it's there's less room for error in older people. Any tips and tricks for this area? Um, probably from an injector's point of view, the, the easiest way to improve your technique is to inject more superficially. Um, something about the rest of clinical medicine means we don't often feel like we're injecting properly unless the needle's at least halfway in, and that's way too far for orbicularis oculi. You can inject with literally maybe a millimeter and a half, then you're sitting just on top of the muscle um, that minimizes your chance of bruising. And it also means the muscle is almost like a shield for what lies underneath. And if you think about what lies underneath, one of the worst side effects I think you can get from toxin is if you affect the zygomatic muscles, because then each time you smile, you get asymmetry in, in your smile, which looks like a stroke. Um, and this comes from injecting too deeply. I've never had a case in, in 12 years of injecting, um, but I've seen some. It's one of the most upsetting for patients because every time they're happy, someone says, oh, God, what's wrong? Uh, you look like you've had a stroke. So um, injecting superficially should completely remove that risk. And obviously don't go too inferior either, but it's mainly about depth. So don't forget to like and subscribe. If you like this video, YouTube is more likely to show it to you next time you log into YouTube and you won't miss any of this great free content. And also get the free download today because there's a, a big manual which I produced a while ago. It's got 26 of your key injection patterns. Um, people love it. I see it being shared on forums all over. So don't miss out. Get that today and see you next week for the rest of the phase. Thanks for watching. Bye.